Hi guys, how's it going? My name is Helena. Welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be answering one of my most frequently asked questions by far that I get in my messages on social media and that is how do I get into astrophotography? In astrophotography there are many different roads you can go down to get into the hobby and my belief is the road you go down has a huge impact on the enjoyment that you get out of it. I've structured this video in a way so that it features three different tiers for three different budgets and hopefully it can appeal to three different types of people that want to get different things out of the hobby. The first tier includes a tripod and a mobile phone. The second tier includes a star tracker or a small portable mount with a DSLR and camera lens. And the third tier is the big observatory grade mount with a telescope and a CMOS camera. Let's get going with the first tier, which as you know, includes a mobile phone and a tripod. Now, most astrophotographers would advise that you steer away from mobile phones when beginning this hobby. And I would also advise that as well. Why have I put it in a tier then? It's sort of to teach you to optimize the equipment that you have while you're saving up for something else on the side, maybe in tier two, such as a DSLR camera. This is gonna give you a kickstart on learning your way around camera settings, especially if you use extended apps, not just the normal camera app on your phone. If you download an extra app that gives you more control over your camera settings, this is gonna help you understand camera settings more. And a fun fact that you may already know, <laughs> but I thought I'd just add it into the video anyway, is phones use CMOS sensors and CMOS sensors are the same sensors that are in a lot of astrophotograph dedicated astrophotography cameras today. So there you go, you learn something new every day. <laughs> So what do I mean when I'm talking about astrophotography with a phone? What kind of astrophotography? Well, today I've got some really, really, really great examples of Milky Way photography that has been done by some fabulous people on Instagram that I follow. And this is just to demonstrate to you what phones these days can do. So I'm gonna put them up on the screen now, flick through them and please feel free to stop and follow these amazing people on Instagram and putting their in Instagram handles up on the screen as well. So the phones that we're looking at are quite high-end phones like the Huawei P30 Pro, the iPhone X and above, and especially the Google Pixel 4. This shot of the Milky Way was taken by Alan Wallace, who is an absolutely insane landscape astrophotographer. Please, please, please go and check out his YouTube channel and Instagram. He's absolutely amazing. And he shot this Milky Way photo with the Google Pixel 4. It has a dedicated astrophotography mode, which I just think is amazing. And I love it so much because it's just opening up astrophotography to a whole new group of people. To make sure that the stars are as sharp as they possibly can, you're gonna want to put your phone on a tripod to stabilize it as much as possible, set it on a timer setting for say 10 seconds and then step away from the area so there's no shake on the ground from you walking around as well. In the Northern Hemisphere, summer is well known for being Milky Way season, but it's always Milky Way season. It's just that the Milky Way core is up in the summer and the winter core is up in the winter. For the core, you're gonna want to be out anytime now, April through to September is really when you're gonna look at photographing the Milky Way core with your phone. On to category number two, which is a really, really popular category within the astrophotography community, based on budget, but also based on portability because if you want a run and gun setup and you want to be moving around a lot of the time, you're not gonna want an observatory grade mount, you're gonna want a small star tracker. The star tracker that I always recommend to people for getting started is the Skywatcher Star Adventurer. There's also things like the Move Shoot Move, which is more based at wide field tracking, not really deep space, but it is possible with it. The Skywatcher Star Adventurer and things like the Ioptron Sky Tracker as well. There are tons of different variations, but as I myself have used the Skywatcher Star Adventurer only out of the three, I can really recommend that one as a go-to for you guys to purchase. Along with this, you're gonna want to use a DSLR camera and a lens. I've seen so many great things done with a kit lens. So if all you have is a DSLR and an 18 to 55 millimeter kit lens, which is basically always the one that comes with Canon cameras, 
then that is going to do you while you wait for other lenses to arrive and while you save up your money. If you're already a photographer and you've already got knowledge of how to use a DSLR camera and you know the ropes of camera settings, you're coming into this hobby at a huge advantage to everyone else because knowing camera settings is absolutely vital for getting the shot that you want to grab. It is essential that you figure out the basics of a DSLR before going out on the field with it because this means you can use it to its full potential when you're out taking photos and you're not wasting dark sky time fiddling around in the dark with settings that you've no idea how to change. Believe me, been there, done that, very, very painful experience. Zero out of 10, would not recommend. <laughs> As for actual cameras themselves, I have used the Canon 60D and the Canon EOS R. Both have been tried and tested and both I know are excellent candidates for going out under the stars. There are so, so, so many more that you can choose from, but those are just two that I've used and I know that work really, really well. As for lenses, kit lenses work great to start with. 18 to 55 millimeter lenses are super. And then if you want to expand your reach with lenses and go a little bit further and extend your budget, things like the Rokinon or the Samyang 135mm lenses are absolutely super as well, or anything by Sigma is great too. The shorter your focal length is on your lens or telescope means that your tracking is going to be more forgiving because when your focal length is reaching numbers like 500, 600, 700 millimetres plus, you have to introduce an auto guiding system, which is a whole new world on its own and it can be really, really daunting to start with for beginners entering the hobby. Now I'd like to dedicate this whole Skywatcher Star Adventurer DSLR camera lens sort of section. It doesn't really have a name to an absolutely incredible young astrophotographer called Olga. I first met Olga when I was just starting out on astrophotography on Instagram. She has been absolutely amazing. Her work is incredible. You need to go and check it out on Instagram. I've left her Instagram handle somewhere on the screen and it will be next to her photos as well. They are absolutely stunning. And the reason I'm showing you her photos are because she's used very similar equipment that I'm talking about in the tier two category. And it just shows what you can produce with portable equipment. You do not need an observatory grade setup to produce stunning results. As Olga is clearly showing us here, just look at these images. How stunning are they? They look so, so good. It's the third and final section, the section where all of your money disappears the first part of a deep sky setup that I'm going to talk to you about is the mount. And the mount is really the heart of any deep sky astrophotography setup. And these sorts of mounts allow you to track to such a high level of accuracy, allowing you to track the stars for a longer period of time, increasing your signal to noise ratio, making your images basically, in short, look absolutely stunning. Now, these mounts are referred to as equatorial go-to mounts, and that means as long as you align it correctly with the North Star and certain stars in the sky, you can slew it to any target in the sky and start imaging. You do not have to manually find the objects yourselves as you did with things like the Star Adventurer or just your phone on a tripod. These alignment processes are by no means easy, but once you do them more and more, you just get better and better and quicker and quicker. But do not rush your setup process. The amount of times that I have gone out, I've looked up, it's clear, and I go down to the garden and set up my equipment really, really quickly. Nine times out of 10, those types of imaging sessions do not go to plan and they completely fail and nothing works because I've forgotten to align something, I've forgotten to balance, I've forgotten to do this, I've forgotten to turn the dew heaters on. It's something I've forgotten and one thing can ruin the whole session. So take your time, set up during the day, it's going to save so much stress during the night time. Going for a heavy mount like this may suggest that you have a higher payload on top, a heavier telescope maybe, and that may equal a higher focal length. And as I was talking about earlier, the smaller your focal length, the more forgiving tracking is. So therefore, the higher your focal length, the less forgiving tracking is. This does mean that you're going to have to introduce an auto guiding system. And if you don't already know, auto guiding is basically when you open up a certain piece of software and you have a separate auto guiding camera 
and that camera is going to lock on to a star in your field of view next to your target and the mount is basically going to keep that star in this little green box all the way through the night and it's going to track that star and compensate for errors in the mount and keep the star in that little box and this basically means that your stars are going to be kept round in your field of view and you're going to be able to take longer sub exposures with an increased signal to noise ratio. A lot of these terms I appreciate are going to be absolutely brand new to some people but I am going to do a full blown tutorial on auto guiding because I feel like there is too much to cover for this one video. As for deciding on which mount to go for, I cannot recommend enough the EQ6R Pro. Its high payload capacity means you have a lot of room to grow. That rhymed. <laughs> However, if you know that for your needs you want to stay within the small refractor range and portability is still something that's in your mind and you're maybe using something like the Sharp Star or the Red Cap 51 or the Radiant Raptor, then something like the Skywatcher HEQ5 Pro will do everything you need it to. If you're looking at something a little bit bigger, the Skywatcher ATED is a fabulous choice and so is the Esprit 80 or the Esprit 100 in the Skywatcher range as well. The highest focal length that I've ever used was with the Esprit 120 and it's 840mm focal length. I've had no issues guiding with it at all on the EQ6R Pro. Those two go really, really well together and I know a lot of people in the Astro community that use the Esprit 120 and the EQ6R Pro. It holds up fine, no struggles at all. I feel like I can only recommend honestly to you guys when I have used the product and I know I haven't used the Esprit 100 but I've never seen a bad review about that telescope. But things like the Esprit 120 and high focal length telescopes, I have only used the Esprit 120 and as far as I can see, it's absolutely brilliant, it's a really popular scope within the community and I think you'd be just just fine if you purchased one yourself. And then finally, as for a dedicated astrophotography camera, there is this huge <laughs> debate between whether you should go colour and whether you should go mono and I'm going to do a completely different video on that as well because there is so so much to say but if you're looking for something to get you started in astrophotography and if you're looking to get into it for the joy of it rather being than being held back by technical issues and having to change filters and using a filter wheel and things like that which come with a mono camera I'd really recommend you to start with a one shot colour camera which is what I have done and things like the ASI 533, the ASI 294 from ZW, the ASI 183 are all really really good candidates. The ASI 071 as well I have seen fantastic results from. Now differences in sensor size and focal length come with different telescopes and cameras and the combination you make is going to create a field of view size and to find this out I really recommend you use a site called Astronomy Tools. I'll leave a link down below in the description. Go and check it out, you can punch in all the details of the equipment that you have or the equipment that you would like to buy and you can sort of see how you would be able to photograph different targets and what point of view you'd be able to photograph them from. These are some shots up on the screen now that I have managed to take with the ASI 294 over the year that I have been using it for. It has been an absolutely fabulous camera and I've really, really enjoyed my time with it. Thank you guys so, so much for watching and staying to the end if you did. I'm a little bit rusty, but we're getting back into it. We're getting there. <laughs> I'll see you in the next video, but until then, keep safe out there and clear skies.